So as we move on to the knee exam, um, it's always important, number one, to inspect the knee. You want to get a good sense of if there are any uh, abnormalities just on an inspection. I'm looking for swelling or what we call an effusion, which would be fluid inside the joint. I'm looking for any scars from previous surgery. Um, some erythema, some warmth. I'm also looking to see if there's any atrophy of the, of the quad muscle, in particular looking, looking at the VMO. Um, and then I'm, I move on to the palpation part of the exam. First thing again, just like the hip, I do a log roll of the knee. Uh, the, it's also important anytime I'm examining a knee is to examine the hip. There are times when people can have only knee pain without any actual knee problem and have the problem in the hip. There are, IT band would be an example of that, right? Well, it's very common, for example, to for, um, it's not common, but it's certainly known that you can have something like hip arthritis or a labral tear, and because of the neuroanatomy of the joints, you only have knee pain and no hip pain at all. So it's really important to make sure there's nothing happening inside the hip when you examine the knee. And there have been times where people have even had surgery on their knee because of knee pain, even though the problem was the hip. And that's because if you have someone, let's say has arthritis of the knee and arthritis of the hip, and they complain of knee pain, they get an injection inside the knee because they have arthritis. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because the problem's really in the hip. They get a knee replacement. Mm. They still have the exact same pain until someone figures out that it's coming from the hip. So and it's truly a referred pain. Truly referred pain. There, we think it's because the obturator nerve has an articular branch in the hip and an articular branch in the knee. And so sometimes it's just, you don't know where it's coming from. It's just your interpretation of the irritation. But it's fairly easy to figure out on an exam because for example, if you came in and said, I have a lot of knee pain and I was able to do this to your knee and you didn't have any discomfort, even if you had arthritis, um, and then I went like this and you're like, oh, that kills. Um, I'll say, listen, Peter, you don't really have a knee problem, you have a hip problem. And oftentimes it's hard to convince somebody wow. of this. And there was one patient I had who just refused to believe. I got x-ray said, look, you have both arthritis of both joints, but I believe this is coming from your hip. She says, doc, this is my knee, I think I know. Uh, and so I, I went to the computer and I Googled, and you know how it sort of auto-populates the words? how come my hip pain, my hip problem, and then it finished it off, causes only knee pain. And then like, okay, I, I, believe, I, I, believe, I, I believe. I thought you were gonna say you did an injection in the hip, it got, the knee pain got better. Well, so then that's what I do. That's what I, that's the next step. I say, listen, let's do this. I'm going to inject your hip. Let's see if it goes away. I'll just give you some lidocaine in there. And if it goes away, then yep. we can move forward. So, for, so the hip, exam is normal. Now we're on to the knee portion. Um, I roll the leg. I just sort of trying to make uh, the patient comfortable. And then I flex up the knee and bring it down. I want to see what the motion is. I will hyperextend the knee and I'll compare to both sides. This is, um, if there's any process inside the hip joint, that will be uncomfortable. If there's fluid in there, if there's a meniscus tear, if you had an acute ligament injury, when I hyperextend on either side, even I can feel someone tensing up. So there's, there's a good sort of a first test and it's pretty gentle to see if there's any process deep inside the knee. So I've taken care of motion and now I'm gonna flex the knees to 90 degrees um, and then I'm gonna palpate the different areas of the knee. So I usually start in the in the front of the knee, I want to check the patellar tendon where it attaches, where it um, originates from the inferior pole of the patella. I move my way down to the tibial tuberosity. I'm checking the quad tendon. Sometimes I'll have, I'll palpate the tendon in different degrees of flexion to see if that generates pain. Hold the leg there. I'm going to push down. And I'll also kind of stress the tendon to see if that causes any discomfort. I'm going to have you bring this down. 
And then next I move around the knee, I palpate in different areas. Again, I'm checking the VMO to see um, if it's well developed or not. I'm palpating in the medial joint line. This is where the meniscus is. This will be painful with meniscus tears. This will be painful with arthritis of the knee as well. As we move down towards the proximal tibia, there's this area right in the front called the pes tendon. The pes is basically three tendons that come the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus um, attach right here at the front of the tibia. This is where we go when we want to harvest tendons for an ACL reconstruction. And some people get bursitis or tendonitis over there, over that area, and that'll be painful. Um, I will use this knee to show the lateral aspect of the knee. Um, say, as we move down the lateral side, what we're going to see is this is where the iliotibial band is. You could feel it. There's a prominence here called the lateral epicondyle, and sometimes people have friction over that area, and that area will be tender. Again, the lateral joint line, lateral arthritis or lateral meniscus tears will also be painful there. And then there's the, the proximal tib fib joint. This is the fibula and the tibia, and that joint sometimes can be a little bit uncomfortable. So this is the palpation of the knee. And then I'm sort of moving on to check um, ligament integrity of the knee. I want to see if there's any problems. Now, a lot of times people come in, they were skiing. They have an acute injury. They have an acute injury. I, so I, I, I sort of have a good sense already. But sometimes people have chronic injuries and their knees hurt or, or old injuries or old previous surgeries. And I want to see if those ligaments that may have been reconstructed are intact. So a couple of ligaments we'll talk about. There's a ligament called the medial patella femoral ligament, which helps keep the kneecap in place. And so I'll push on the patella and move it over to see if that causes any apprehension. So if I push it over and it moves further than I would expect compared to the other side, and more importantly, if it makes you uncomfortable, that would be a positive apprehension test. Uh, as we work our way, the ACL, one test is called the anterior drawer where I'm flexing the knee and pulling forward. Um, and then as How we much movement do you get in a person with a torn ACL? Depends. So a lot depends on what, the other, what your normal is. Uh, we, if we base it on millimeters of translation, a torn ACL, it's typically three millimeters or more of translation would indicate a complete ACL rupture. But if it's between zero and three, it often can mean a partial tear. And I have zero, even though it sort of feels like it's moving. So really what I'm saying zero, I'm saying from zero to three, I'm saying zero to three compared to the other side. Yeah. So everybody has their normal, and normal I would say in millimeters, and we know this because we have a device called the KT arthrometer, which measures translation. I'd say a normal is between five and seven mostly, but some people are really loose. Wow, so think about that for a second. Normal is five to seven. A complete tear of the ACL only gives you another three. Right, that's, but that's the lowest, right? So because there are other supporting structures, if you've got a meniscus that can affect the translation, oftentimes a acute rupture, I'll see at 10 millimeters, 12 millimeters, 15 millimeters more than the other side. Wow. But if it's three, it's a sign that it's real. Mm. Less than three, I'm like, this probably isn't fully torn. And how much do you trust that over what the MRI tells you? It's amazingly sensitive. The KT is amazingly sensitive. In fact, it was used before MRI, uh, and it's been studied. It said it was, it was I think, 98% sensitive at detecting a ACL tear. And how specific? Very. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the number, but I can yeah, check. Yeah. I, we rarely use, I use the KT, not really uh, much anymore for an acute injury, unless I feel the knee. And the, the, most, the most sensitive test, short of the KT, is called the Lachman exam, where I'm stabilizing the femur with one hand, and I'm putting an anterior translation, and I'm feeling for that endpoint. You feel how it stops? Yeah. So that's the endpoint. That's the ACL catching. That's the ACL catching. So it won't go any further. And I know that your ACL is intact. But if it feels a little soft or spongy, then I might get the KT out. Or the other thing is sometimes people have an acute injury, their knee is swollen, and they won't let me do that. So the KT is very tolerable even in the acute situation, more than even my exam. So if I have someone I'm pretty sure, and it 
it's one of those things where I also want to let the patient know this is what I think it is and here's some data to tell you why I think it is. Um, but also sometimes I think it's not, but they think it is. And so I use it and I say, look, this is what your left knee is. This is the number we get. This is what your right knee is. This is the number we get. And like, okay, it makes people feel comfortable. Got it. Um, so that, you know, so for ACL, anterior drawer, the Lachman, there's also something called the pivot shift test, pivot shift test, where I'm putting a little bit of valgus stress on your knee. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to see if there's any clunk. When the iliotibial band moves forward of the axis of rotation, the knee will sort of clunk into place. That's also very difficult to do in the acute setting. Almost no one will let you do that. But in the chronic setting, they will. Um, as, so if we move to um, the posterior cruciate ligament, I do also in 90 degrees. And I'm, what I'm feeling for here is that I can put my finger on your tibia. I feel the tibia plateau medially. If I can't feel that, if it's flush, the tibia is flush with the medial condyle, it means that your tibia is shifted backwards mm. because the PCL is helping to keep this position. It's called a posterior sag sign. So if I feel that, we're good, but I'll also just push to see if I can do that. Sometimes I'll change the rotation of the ankle and push, and sometimes like if, if it's torn or I think it might be torn, I might sort of interrogate that a little further. So those are the cruciate ligaments in the center of the knee. We also have collateral ligaments, the medial collateral ligament, the lateral collateral ligament. Let me start with the medial collateral ligament. So I do it in extension, and basically I'm pushing a force. MCL tears are very common in association with ACL tears, but they also happen an isolated injury, most MCL injuries happen proximal. So the MCL, to go over it again, connects the medial epicondyle to the proximal tibia. And when it ruptures, the majority of the times it ruptures from this side. Even if it's a grade three rupture, meaning a complete tear, and it's from the, medi from the proximal attachment, those typically here will heal without surgery. If it's completely torn from the distal aspect, that often needs surgery. That's a more significant and severe. So when people get the triad, so that classic injury where you're hit from the side, you're Correct. skiing and someone comes into you or you're goofing around playing football, you get hit on the outside. It's the ACL, the MCL, and the medial meniscus? Yes. Now, that's the classic triad. To be honest, in acute injuries, we see more lateral meniscus tears than medial meniscus tears. Interesting. Despite sort of that triad that we're all taught. But um, you're generally, if it's a normal, but, but it's the MCL that's torn. Yes. Yeah. And it's typically torn proximally. Correct, or mid-sub. And you're not repairing it then. You're just gonna repair the ACL. So um, what we say is, I'm probably not going to repair it. It's probably going to be stable, but after you reconstruct the ACL, you check the MCL before you leave the operating room. And if it's lax, then you have to fix that too. Uh, and so we check that in about zero degrees and 20 to 30, just to see. People with multiple ligament injuries, it's important to get all of these because you're sort of working through, okay, this is super lax. What is really torn? Because when the knee's flopping around, sometimes it's difficult to do. Um, for the, let's do the lateral, so the lateral structures, there's also a lateral collateral ligament. I'm going to do it on this side, um, which, which originates from the lateral femoral condyle and attaches to the proximal fibula, not the tibia, but the fibula. And there's also other supporting structures. We refer to this as the posterior lateral corner which comprises of, of other, the popliteus tendon and other tendons in the back, that this can be a, an extremely severe injury to rupture all of those structures. And so a similar fashion we do, instead of the valgus stress, where we're stressing the inside, we do what's called a varus stress at zero and a little bit of flexion to see if that's loose. And sometimes you can palpate the ligament and feel that it's taut. So, um, MPFL for patella, ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL, posterior lateral corner, pretty much the ligaments we worry about. Um, meniscus tears, there are some provocative maneuvers we do to see if there's a meniscus tear. Most popular one is McMurray, where I'm just sort of feeling the joint line 
and seeing if I feel anything, if I feel a click or I feel a pop, or more importantly, does this generate pain? If someone has a significant meniscus tear, they're not gonna let me do that. They're gonna stop me and it's gonna say, okay, this is probably real. So the, the combination of pain with hyperextension and pain with this sort of maneuver, there are other things that do it. Obviously, if they have an arthritic knee, I'm not going to do that because I already have a sense. So not everybody gets every test because... What is the most um, common misdiagnosis in the knee based on the failure to do a very, very thorough physical exam? It's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think that sometimes we forget about the patella in all of this and you can have someone come into the office and they say, I was skiing, I twisted, I felt a pop, my knee filled up with fluid right away. And we're all saying to ourselves, oh, you have an ACL tear. And so it's hard to do an exam in that area. So sometimes those two things, if you don't examine both, you may miss one. Now they can happen together. That's very uncommon, but it's important just to check those things.